This week's episode of Still Untitled is made possible with support from Microsoft Surface, introducing the new Microsoft Surface Laptop 3. With its beautiful touchscreen, you'll experience stunning graphics with razor-sharp resolution, now available with a 13.5 or 15-inch screen. And with the latest processors, there's no project that the Surface Laptop can't handle. It's both light and powerful, so you can get more done on the go. Visit surface.com slash laptop3 to learn more. That's surface.com slash laptop three. Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Norm. I'm Adam. Hello, it's Richard Taylor. I'm Johnny Fraser Allen. Oh my goodness. Hello, gentlemen. Great to have you back with us. Oh, Thanks. it is so nice to be here. Um, Keep saying, when are you going to move? <laughs> <laughs> someday soon. Someday <laughs> soon. Um, yeah. So we're down here in New Zealand. We're visiting Weta Workshop. I, I, before we get started talking about what's going on in some of our recent projects, I wanted to talk about my first two hours here in Wellington. <laughs> <laughs> Which is... we all got to make it colorful. <laughs> <laughs> I landed a few days ago uh, at 9 in the morning, and Richard, you picked me up at mm -hmm. the airport, brought me over here to Weta because you had a trailer full of concrete you wanted to take up north, and so we picked up the trailer, <laughs> attached it to your ute, started heading through Wellington when the brakes on the trailer locked up. That's right, right? Yeah, yeah, they did. For they, some reason, a mechanical failure in the brakes, which I'd already had repaired twice, <laughs> uh, they locked again. Uh, and needless to say, it turned to custom pretty quick. It did. We started, our brakes started smoking. People in the street started yelling at us and pointing. And we we're like, we know, we know. And then this guy got out of his car and started pounding on our car and yelling at us to stop in the middle of traffic. It was very dramatic. I, don't I mean, it, it was great that he was uh, yes. so caring, but the thing he didn't realize, it would have been irresponsible of us to pull over where he was suggesting because we were in the busiest street in Wellington and we would have snarled the traffic up. So to the detriment of my trailer, it was worth pulling it around the corner. Wow. And we pulled it around the corner into the parking lot of... A brake specialist. <laughs> uh, we didn't even realize, did we, when no. we pulled in? But after we'd solved the calamity with the fire extinguisher this gentleman uh, unceremoniously gave to me uh, as I was trying to get my own one out of the car, and you, uh, I've got Adam down, he's on his knees looking under the trailer, and I chuck him a fire extinguisher. Well, wait, wait, this is the best part, is that the fire extinguisher actually came from your wife, who happened to be driving by at that instant. She was also armed with fire extinguishers. By total coincidence, my wife and daughter went past at the very moment we pulled into the car park. This, this, is, this is my perfect story about how small and perfect New Zealand is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. And Tanya came to the rescue because we needed some... Um, uh, counterbalance on the trailer. Yeah, Remember we, that? So you and I could push it into the dockway of the actual brake specialist. We took all the concrete out and put it in the wheel wells in the backs of both cars we now had. And it was like that myth, that famous story of the, of the guy who went to Home Depot and tried to, he tried to put all the materials for building a house onto a hatchback. And so you can see in this picture, he's got like a foot thick stack of plywood on the top of this hatchback. <laughs> and what you can't see is he also has 1,200 pounds of concrete bags <laughs> yeah. inside. Yeah. And the car is riding a half inch above the ground. We did this on Mythbusters. We were actually able to drive forward a few feet in this car. And that's what it felt like. Yeah, it did. My wife's car, she's got a, a Toyota RAV4. And that was like <laughs> under the weight of concrete. <laughs> And oh. then we and then we went up to the farm, and so all that was in the first two hours of landing. I felt completely at home. And in the same weekend, you were driving diesel uh, locomotives down New Zealand railway tracks, and uh, helping uh, build things and make things, and it's fantastic. A fantasy camp weekend. I love yeah. it. I love that the nature of your creatively. Uh, you know, frantically creative life has led to both you and your wife having to constantly carrying fire extinguishers. <laughs> <laughs> Anything will, can and will happen. Yeah. Yes, invariably it does. And <laughs> thankfully, I, my wife is extremely tolerant when it does happen. Yeah. Uh. Well, there's, uh, years and years and years ago, I pined after this, this woman who did not return my interest. <laughs> Uh, but she did reiterate this story to me. At one point, she was in bed with her boyfriend at the time, Whoa. whose last name, I might add, was Mateless. <laughs> uh, not, a, not in this situation. Not a, not a positive name. Anyway, they were snuggling in bed, and they were talking about 
um, you know, Pillow talk about disaster, and he when said, they saw you at the window. No, no. <laughs> okay, okay. No. He yeah. said to her, "If there was a big earthquake, would you run over to my house?" And she went, "Hell no! I'm going to Savages." Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so at least I'm good at a crisis. Yeah. Um, it is always so great to get down. It's been about it's been about ten months since the mm -hmm. last time I yep. was here, and there's been, as always, a lot going on. Yeah, we've been very, very busy. Huge number of projects have gone past. On average, we design on over 50 projects a year through our design studio, and we manufacture on average about seven major film, television, or location-based experience projects a year. So in the 10 months since you were last here, oh a God. lot has happened. I almost <laughs> find that as a good cadence, because that was here two years ago, and. We filmed, that's when we did uh, Farewell to Arms, the short film, mm -hmm. and the Armor. Yeah, yeah. And there was so much in the workshop we couldn't film, but we were being hinted at that. That was a lot of work. And so maybe two years later now, some of that stuff is finally being, you know, going to cinema soon. I think like Mulan's coming out soon. Mm. Yes, and yeah, that's that exciting. being worked on. And uh, we're in the thick of Avatar, which is mm -hmm. extraordinary for us, of course, because uh, we so thoroughly enjoyed working on the original for a number of years, and we're now back in uh, into that world. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, actually, as you, you know, you guys have been a special effects house from almost the uh, the very beginning of digital effects being used in film until now, when they've taken over mm. so much of the actual business. That must change the very language with which you discuss with directors because 20 years ago a director needed to be pretty versed in a lot of different disciplines to do special effects. Yes, but today uh, many directors uh, have not got that uh, depth of understanding of physical effects specifically right. because they've grown up uh, in recent years as a young filmmaker primarily if not exclusively working in digital effects. Mm -hmm. They can, in many cases, they're doing them themselves on, right. on their own uh, computer, or they've put together a team of uh, university graduates or friends that have helped them make their first short film and then their first feature film. So with some directors, uh, it's a process of inspiring them to think about physical effects. And uh, what's lovely today, though, is that uh, we're getting some directors, and I Am Mother is a very good example mm -hmm. of a movie by an amazing director that came to us uh, only focused on trying to do it with a physical suit. And this uh, is, a, this is a, a, a film about a robot that's raising a child on a space station or on a, yeah. a, a, in a, a alone. Mm -hmm. It's funny, I would say traditionally it would be done digitally. Of course. <laughs> you know, over the last 10, 15 years, that's how it predominantly have been done. But he felt, and we entirely agreed, that the intimacy and connection between the child, which is the absolute uh, critical part of the whole movie working, yeah. and the robot could not be um, realized if it wasn't through the connection of a physical actor in a suit working with the actress. And there's a lot of people that watch this movie that don't even realize that there's an actor <laughs> no. in the suit. They think it must be CG because we're, we're, we're inured to that. Even yeah. at Comic-Con, right? You brought the suit to Comic-Con and I think I chatted with people who saw the suit behind the glass and they thought it was just like a maquette. Or yeah, something. or a standard. Exactly, yeah. that mm. sometimes are built or, you know, to yeah. have physicalized digital things, but it's the opposite. And you can totally understand why, because sure. the vernacular of effects and film today is in that world. And uh, it's not, I've never really seen it as a competition. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the right um, solution for the, for the particular challenge. And uh, I like the fact that we can complement Weta Digital and other companies as they do us. And to be able to talk to each other because you're, you're doing stuff that has to match. I, I love the fact that in I Am Mother, uh, the robot actor, our, our friend and your wonderful colleague, Luke Hawker, was also the also built the costume, worked on the team that built the costume. So he had to get bolted into this. We 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 shot a test video about this, watching him get bolted into the spoiler yeah. costume, which is not trivial for anyone, but made much easier by the fact that he helped design. Oh and yeah, sorry, and he's got no grounds for complaint. Right. <laughs> he's going to have to suffer if he designed and built it along with the team. Right. The, the only and, other situation I've I've heard of where the artist was focused on. Uh, directing the build and performed the character was Ron Muick as Ludo in Labyrinth, I think. I can't think of another situation where where a main 
character in a movie that's a creature feature yeah. was the guy, worked on the, by the person. Yeah, the guys at uh, Amalgamated Dynamics build the suits that they wear. Rick Baker's another excellent oh, example. Oh, yeah, 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 of course, of course yeah. uh, most famously in yeah. the De Laurentiis King Kong, where mm -hmm. he saved the movie. In fact, he was the movie because of his suit wearing wow. capabilities. Yeah. Well, and, and I think you'll find many of the effects right. guys of the world have oh, ultimately at some point been in suits that have ended up in the films. Lon Chaney Jr. Of course, yeah, yeah most, most significantly. Famously. Yeah. yeah. Um, it gives them a, 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 an intimacy with the suit and an ability to, to push it to its limit that an actor might not be able to find necessarily. Yeah, yeah. even my wife Tanya was, uh, in fact, I think I was telling Adam recently on a, on a discussion we were having that Tanya built the suit of uh, Uncle Les in Braindead and then had to wear it, wow. <laughs> which is the one where the spine has been ripped out of the back of Les's yeah. body and the head's bobbing around. So Tanya spent the whole day gripping her ankles, bent double at the stomach, waddling around <laughs> in the suit. Ultimately became very unwell, but um, uh, but you know you do wow. you do what you got to do. Um, one of the things I love that you do, Richard, is you don't just uh, you aren't just a service provider here. You very much take it as your personal mission to uplift and push out front New Zealand artists and, and craftspeople. Uh, and Johnny here is, is, is a beneficiary yeah. of that and yeah. also yeah, an incredible talent. And we've done a bunch of tested videos about your stuff. Do what you remember you... that first time? We covered your labyrinth. You so I, labyrinth? I remember it. Um, <laughs> and as, as proud as I, I was to, to be part of a show that I was already a huge fan of, um, it's embarrassing for me in the sense that, well, how that test of video came about is Adam was here and in passing in the hallway, I said, hi, Adam, uh, I loved the Stanley Kubrick hedge maze you were doing. I'm working on a miniature of the labyrinth, which is kind of the same thing because they use the same hedge maze in both films. And Adam, Adam's like, oh, which room are you in? Sculpting, can I come see you tomorrow? I'm like, yeah, sure, mate. And that's as much <laughs> as I thought it was me. So the next day, Adam shows in and is like, oh, so this is it. And while he's talking to me, someone's taking a light reading, someone's putting a microphone on me. <laughs> and, and, like, and then I'm, I'm, I'm showcasing this very small, unfinished piece of what I know is gonna be this big thing. Um, and I, I look like it was some sort of, um, you know, wetter, um, helps the homeless sort of day. So, <laughs> and um, after that video came out, I was like, I've got to take better care of myself and I've got a haircut. And anyway, but, and then so when, when I heard you were coming back the next time, I put a lot of work into making sure that I was going to show what I was intending to do in the first place and you weren't going to catch me off guard again. You know? <laughs> um, but, 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 you know, just, just the response I got from that first video of showing what I considered incredibly average um, beginning of something was, oh wow, okay, that's, that's amazing. And so, you know, uh, then I went into the, where do they get a load of me sort of mode and did the, finished it sort of. And then the response to that w was, uh, was so informative and overwhelming that it, it completely directed um, the company I was able to form from more or less that video in, in some ways into the next product, which um, we'll, be, we'll be showing you tomorrow in a video. Yeah. Um, that was built directly around feedback um, so from 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 your from your content and videos, which is great because, I mean, that shows for me cle more clearly than anything that you got you, both of you have just um, created the most perfect uh, content provider for the like-minded uh, makers. And I love the word you use that you keep using that word maker. You know, and, and it's not just creatives, because no. there's all sorts of creative, but makers is, is... I very specifically talk about making, and I don't limit it to physical objects. And the broadest definition I've come to is making is anytime you use your point of view to bring something that didn't exist into existence. Yeah. So that could be a dress or a poem or a song or a table. And when you say uh, a forum for telling stories to makers, I... Richard and I were talking this weekend about uh, one of my favorite books is Self-Reliance by Ralph Waldo Emerson. In one of the very first paragraphs, he says, to know that what is true in your private heart is true for all, that is genius. Right. And this is the reason your video resonated, specifically because you're so 
I mean, I say insane with the highest of compliments sure. because I share. We all share yeah. the same insanity. Uh, it's such a pure love of bringing something extant mm. that that resonates to anybody that sees it. Of like, holy cow, look at that, and there it is, and now you get to experience it. And, well, and I might say, of course, that. Uh, People such as Johnny and many others uh, that has preceded Johnny and are here in the building mm -hmm. right now are uh, very gracious in their thanks to myself and Tanya for giving them the environment, the platform, yeah. in some cases the funding to do these things. But we benefit hugely too, as you know only yeah. too well, from your interactions with the people that you, both of you are uh, building a community for. Uh, the opportunity to hang out and uh, live in this in these worlds <laughs> yeah. uh, is mm. phenomenally rewarding. And then to see how they then um, spurn on other people and uh, that and that virtuous cycle that yeah, starts. It's to build really it. really well, actually quite beautiful. Talk about this. It really resonated for me with uh, how Weta and Richard have been for me. You're talking about when Jamie. Uh, Heinemann gave you the opportunity to, when he hired you, he let you use his shop yes. and, and you learned so much from that. And from, you know, Richard hired me straight out of high school and uh, it really kicked off for me when King Kong wrapped up and there was kind of like some downtime of, you know, we didn't have work for everyone because we had fluctuates and stuff, yeah. mm -hmm. a big project. I, I asked, well, is it okay if I, because I'd fallen in love with sculpting by that stage. I kept creeping off to the sculpting room in my breaks and uh, annoying everyone there and tried to learn as much as I could. And I asked Richard if, um, even though I'm uh, for a short period of time, however long it is, not working for Weta, would it be okay if I can keep coming in and, and teach myself how to sculpt? Of course. Didn't even know why I was asking it, you know? And, um, and that's when I made a life-size hoggle and some other stuff. And, and my first sculpting lesson was with Richard in the, in the kitchen just out there. I showed him my first sculpt of a goblin. And um, he got a teaspoon out of the drawer and said, like, the mouth uh, should be deeper. And, and he's carving into my first sculpt. And, <laughs> and, and um, you got to get used to that pretty quickly around here. And I remember in about 10 minutes, I felt like I'd had like a three-year um, course in sculpting with a teaspoon, you know? And, and, and that, that when, uh, and it, you know, it just kept going and going to the point, in 2007, I was in my early 20s, I did uh, an entire exhibition where I redesigned the Labyrinth, I'm no, sorry, I redesigned Wizard of Oz and uh, Alice in Wonderland um, while listening only to Tom Waits, because I was in my 20s, I thought that was cool <laughs> to, 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 to try and sure. get, engage it into the artwork. Yeah. And Richard came up to the exhibition and brought the whole thing. You know, which funded the next two years of my artistic endeavours, <laughs> um, which became this massive project That's... called The Gloaming, uh, which Richard also, uh, <laughs> like, like Magwitch um, to, to Finn, or Pip as it was, uh, in, uh, in Dickens, you know, he, yeah. he, yeah. he uh, acquired all of that from me, which, uh, which, was, which enabled me to um, not... So I was able to create these in the, um, the creative mecha chocolate factory that is wetter, which was enough just just because you're surrounded by genius, right? Yeah. But um, Richard also um, was such a helpful benefactor of my work that he, he, he owns nearly all of it. <laughs> well, I, I, can I just yeah, explain yeah, for a moment, one of the reasons that I purchased that first exhibition uh, is that Johnny had it up for sale. And had I not, the artwork would have dissipated In to the pieces. four corners. Right. And for a young artist, one of the most critical things is, is to have a collection that you can hang as a gallery of art. Yeah. And I saw so fundamentally in Johnny's early work that he would go on to do wonderful and great things. And if his collection wasn't held and held closely where he could access it or we could exhibit it, and we've held some beautiful exhibitions, even taking as far afield as Korea yeah. and exhibiting it there twice, mm. uh, so that uh, people get to see all of his art. And that's really what motivated it, uh, rather than... Um, oh, also, I, I just love Johnny's <laughs> art. So, um, my, even my, my father now has a very beautiful, almost shrine-like section of his house dedicated to Johnny's oh. art, which is really nice.
Before we continue on with the show, I want to let you know that support for Still Untitled comes this week from Microsoft Surface, introducing the new Microsoft Surface Laptop 3. With its beautiful touchscreen, you'll experience stunning graphics with razor-sharp resolution. Now available with a 13.5 or 15-inch screen. And with the latest processors, there's no project the Surface Laptop can't handle. It's both light and powerful, so you can get more done on the go. Visit surface.com slash laptop3 to learn more. That's surface.com slash laptop3. Now back to the show. And it is a virtuous cycle, right? Like Jamie knew, I didn't know that he knew this, but Jamie knew that letting me come in on weekends and have access to the shop to, to try stuff out made me more valuable to him. It was yeah. a direct exchange. Well, that's that's the comment that I was going to. That's the comment that really resonated to me because um, I'm up, I'm now up directing a, a big project for Richard and Weta that you've seen, mm -hmm. and but so the reason Richard thought of me to art direct that is because I had um, made my own world of the gloaming right. and wandering woods and Hagwathon Hollow. Um, I was able to do those. I was able to find my feet as an artist on those projects yeah. because of the opportunity Richard and Weta had presented me. Um, had they not presented those opportunities to me, I wouldn't have been the right fit to art direct this project mm -hmm. for Weta. You know, and and um, this is why it's so mm -hmm. important as a young as a young person. I don't even think to limit it to creative enterprise, but to when you're starting out in your career, to point to the things that you want to know about. And tell if your boss doesn't realize that that's a value, mm -hmm. then they're not a good boss. Because anytime one of your employees says, "I'm curious about this thing," that means they're going to get really good at that if you give them that opportunity. Of course, you want every person that's working with you to be highly inquisitive, highly motivated, driven to explore and experience their own worlds, because that is only helping to hone their craft, and in turn, uh, you know create something very special around the team. And I, and I know that what you love to do here, and it's so inspiring, and you talk to people here, and they started in one department, they moved to another, uh -huh. they did a third, they're learning something else. Um, and it's not like uh, it's a, any kind of creative dictatorship where there's one creative mind and it just spills out to everybody else. It's that you're counting on everybody on the team to bring their creativity mm. to bear on the yeah. thing that they're working on. We, we have literally had the young gentleman that is our uh, cleaner, he looks after the facility, make a suggestion which we've actioned. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, cause, because why shouldn't it come from anywhere? It doesn't matter uh, where it comes so, from. Yeah. The only time Richard's ever discouraged me is perhaps I could be more tidier in my workspaces because <laughs> I work in chaos. Um, Richard taught me something quite valuable myself one day after years of uh, my workspace being cluttered. He just said to me, oh, you, you kind of like, it just, you had this resigned tone of like, you do really need to work in chaos, don't you, Johnny? And I didn't realize that that was, it was completely true. But I'm going to try, I'm, after, after every tool's a hammer, I'm really quite interested in doing some knolling and, and cleaning my workspace up and being more efficient. But the other discouragement is maybe I shouldn't use power tools quite so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is actually, it's, so it's fascinating when you get feedback about your process and it changes the way you think about it. Because uh, something I pointed out to someone the other day is that very few times in our lives does someone come to us with their creative output and says specifically, please tell me what you think about this. Right. Right? It's a huge responsibility when someone really does ask for no holds barred, tell me the real thing. And giving someone that perspective, like, you like to work in chaos. Like, okay, that is a thing. And is that, does that match with all the other ways in which I want to work? Mm -hmm. And maybe it does. And maybe it doesn't. When, when I... Uh, I get to meet a lot of people that have done creative things and they want to share them uh, with me. And I will ask them, uh, would you like me to look at this with you uh, and give compliment or would you like feedback? And yeah. I, I always ask because yeah. uh, you need to check because for some people it's their, it's their life blood has flowed into it and they're not here to get critical feedback. Uh, they're here to have acknowledgement for what they've achieved. But those that do ask for critical feedback uh, then will get a very um, thoughtful but very honest yeah. appraisal of, of the object or the sculpture or so on. 
Um, you know, I, I interview people in this room at the far end of this table and do a great deal, a great number of people every year. And I just jumped back for a moment, Adam, to something that you mentioned uh, when you were talking about what uh, creativity uh, and the ability to make or, you know, means to you. And I say to a number of people that come in every year who say, I'd love to work at Weta, but I've never done anything. Hmm. And I said, have you ever done some macrame, you call it macrame, I think. <laughs> or do you do you uh, do felting, or maybe you uh, you make uh, uh, bed spreads, or you know what? It, there's got to be something, and invariably the person, of course, mm -hmm. has some craft that they didn't think was worthy of showing because right. it wasn't this. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's all about uh, hand skills, color, balance capability, dedication, irrelevant to what the actual product is. Yeah. Doesn't have to be a makeup or a creature. No. And uh, we have found, uh, with reference to your comments on the items that uh, you were saying had detail beyond detail, our most um, extraordinary person that does beading here, extremely complex beading, uh, would never have thought to bring me initially a piece of beading, never thinking that it would connect the dots to a yeah. job. But that person's hand skills are uh, beyond anything you could almost imagine mm. and therefore beneficial. Well, so this is uh, an art director at Industrial Light and Magic told me this thing years ago, which I really liked. Because someone said to me, oh, you work at ILM, I have a digital portfolio. Would you ask one of the digital people there, what they'd like to see in a portfolio. And the head of digital said, they've got to bring in something that I know what it looks like. Because if you bring me a digital portfolio of stuff you've designed, it's probably great. But you're, I'm not going to hire you right away to design. I'm going to hire you to solve problems for me. And if you bring me a digital drawing of a 57 Cadillac and it's perfect, I'll know. Yeah. And that will tell me that you're useful to me. Do you know that very thing yeah, that's is partially great. what got me the job here because I came to Richard um, 19 years, years old and I'd completely redesigned um, every about, about 17 different characters from The Wizard of Oz. Right. But I, I did them three different ways and I remember Richard saying, you have no idea how many people bring me a design, and, which is just one design, it's like this is what Aragorn should have looked like or something like that. Right. But the fact that I'd shown three very different ideas but, um, of that one character helped. But the reason I chose Wizard of Oz was because it was a fantasy film that, if, if, even if you've not read the book, Wizard of Oz to me felt like a universal language that everybody understood. Right. So when I said this is the Tin Man, Richard knew the background to the Tin Man yep. and why because the three drawings looked completely different, but and Scarecrow, Lion, everyone knows these characters. Um, and so I, yeah, I thought ahead about, like, I, I could say, this is um, Raxnar the Great from Quifalon 7 or something. Right. And it's like, yes it is. Uh, sure. you know, I, well, and this is the thing, is that a lot of people who are doing what they might think of as crafting at home, a word I hate, um, where they're, Look, a lot of beginning makers begin with recapitulation. They make something that they've seen and they want it. Mm. And they think that cheapens what they've done because no, they've no, made an invitation. No, In no, fact, no. It, that's the very thing exactly. that makes them valuable. Exactly. I learned how to sculpt from remaking Hoggle. Yes. And I chose Hoggle because I knew I'd never be satisfied until I got my favorite character right. But if I was, sculpt and if I was sculpting a goblin, there was no point, like my version of a goblin, at any point that could have been, yep, that's yeah, my version of a goblin. Done. But I would. I'd push myself further than I would have because I was trying to capture something that meant a lot to me yeah. and I became a better sculptor for it and it also just awoke in this demon for sculpting in me because I enjoyed the process so much. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to say is uh, 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 in terms of encouraging people to work, it was really lovely on Saturday when you picked me up. We came by here and we did a sweep through the shop to just say hi to whoever was here and there's about 10 or 12 people in various parts of the shop and many of them were working on their own projects. Mm. Mm -hmm. Many of them are working on their own cosplays, yeah, cosplays their own art uh, projects. helmets, yeah, art projects. I know yeah. it's lovely. I uh, I feel very fortunate that we can actually offer people that environment, and you know, the, and then there's people such as David Tremont, of course, who you've yes. kindly yeah. <laughs> supported so significantly with your comments on his books and so on, who is always in here because yeah. that is literally the lifeblood that flows through him if he's not touching the tools and he's at the materials building something, then uh, he's not feeling fulfilled. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I 
am here at pretty extreme hours, as you can imagine, <laughs> and David is never not at his desk. Come New Year's Day, Christmas Day, his birthday, he'll be there at the desk building. And um, that, that's neat. It yeah. really is. Yeah. I, I trick myself into that I'm taking a break because Saturdays is my break day, yeah. and I use Saturday to build a Star Wars spaceport in my garage. <laughs> but that's still work. Yeah. And I'm still, like, I'm, and I, I probably stress over that more than the stuff I should be doing because it needs to be perfect or whatever. But that's my, that's my weekend treat to myself but it's still going to be doing something it's your refueling yeah. Yeah. that's exactly what I do as you're aware <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, to a finish much hard bigger, all no week and then the weekend every Monday morning these guys come in and I point I said, I built some stuff over the weekend <laughs> and I didn't film it I'm sorry <laughs> uh, yeah. um, I want to say I have this feeling and I have not told you this Richard but we spent a lot of time chatting and doing podcasts in this room where we have all these amazing collectibles around and I want to say the prevailing thing I think of as I walk through and look at each collectible is I think about the final paint job. I think about the sculpt and the detail and all that. But for me, that any one of these, the most fun part is those last washes oh, that course, take your paint job and so bring it all together. Part, yeah. yeah, and I actually think it was the signature that we brought to the collectibles business. You know, there are incredible artists in the yeah. collectibles business. And uh, But when we had the opportunity to get into this business, when we got a chance to collaborate uh, with a sideshow on the early Lord of the Rings collectibles, which are actually right behind your head by total <laughs> chance, uh, it was exactly the desire that we had had to bring that the world onto the characters, the mud of the world onto the characters, the pigments that we then carried through to the collectibles. And... Uh, People weren't really doing that at the time. Yeah. People wanted to collect beautiful, shiny, perfect collectibles. So that that was a nice opportunity to do something really special. And I agree, I go down and enjoy art directing that final pass when yeah. I when I get the chance. It's 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 it, like it's so thrilling when you I I've talked about it on Tested a lot that weathering always requires <coughs> at least three different colors, no matter how light your weathering mm -hmm. is. And that fact is, is that second and third pass of like a light brown or a green or whatever it is that made the things pop is always a magic trick to me. It always... Absolutely. Yeah. Just last night, after you guys left the, uh, the building, I uh, went down to check. I'd asked if I could go and check some uh, hanging sheep carcasses that <laughs> our guys had spent the whole afternoon airbrushing perfectly. And, and they were looking pretty good. Uh, but they weren't right. Yeah. So what I did is I mixed up three tubs of sloppy paint and tipped them from the top. I saw those let, this yeah, morning. Okay, I let, them run, that yeah, yeah. let them run down and get into all the creases and crevices and look like it was some form of rot that had set in. Yeah. And uh, I said to the young chap that had done a beautiful job painting them, uh, you know, let let the gravity and nature take over and bring this. Uh, and I, it's yeah, and I was taught that lesson myself. We were working on a TV commercial 30 years ago for Volgers coffee beans, <laughs> and these two brilliant model makers that had built this rock face that the actor was going to climb up was in there with tiny brushes, tickling away like this. And the art director, a guy called Rick Coford just walked in, picked up a bucket of paint and just threw it like this wow. all over their paint job. Literally, like as that, exactly as I describe it, just chucked the paint. And it was like <gasps> this huge intake of, uh, and these two guys were you know, somewhat <laughs> taken aback. But of course, over the next three or four minutes, the paint settled and ran and and right. I was like, boy, there's a life lesson in model making yes. right there. So when, it, when I aged my G-scale railway uh, carriages and locomotives, same thing. I put the pigments on, spritz with methylated spirits, and then don't touch it. Just let the world do what the world does. <laughs> you and I shared the experience that like most of my best paint jobs are ha happen as I'm trying to scrape off yeah, my worst paint a job. Bad yeah, paint job. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yes, I think we've all. The trick is to know that you're actually making it better as you try and fix it. Well, there's yeah. a, a Kurt Vonnegut wrote years ago about his girl, his his daughter when she was in second grade, and she was coming home with these artworks that were. Um, masterpieces of abstract art. Yeah. And he went in for the parent-teacher meeting and he was like, 
everything your class produces is amazing. And the third graders aren't doing it. It's the second graders. And she's like, well, second graders are freer with their minds than third graders. And all I do is I take the drawing away from them when the time is right. Yeah. Oh. She's, yeah. She says stop. Yeah, yeah extracts. <laughs> yeah. It's that kind of yeah. gut instinct thing. The, the best thing I've learned from my own work in the last couple of years was I, I, I love drawing with pencil and, and stuff, but I, I've learned to not now draw for the finished illustration, especially when I'm designing a character. I, I, I don't worry about rub out marks or anything. I just draw it as fast and as fluent as I can, and then that piece of art is what informs the finished thing. But I come up with, with and if I try to replicate that, um, well, those are some cool things, and I try to redraw it properly or whatever, what have yeah, you. Yeah. I, I never captures the, the same angles and the life that's in that sketch. The vitality. So I'll just trace yeah. over that and clean up the line work from the vitality yeah. of that. Sometimes. When you go to his workroom, they are literally scattered across the floor <laughs> like newspaper. Yeah. And I, I go in and I start gathering them up and I'm like, oh, how can you be so... Because they're so exquisite. And they're just he's just drawing them and almost chucking them off the I'm desk. I'm trying to catch up with what's happening as well. Well, and that's yeah. the thing is that we're looking like when we're when we're when we're generating something, we're looking for that what feels like an accident. It's not. It's part of the process of the structure of the process. But we're looking for that thing that's like oh, that catches my eye. This is yeah. the thing, and we grab that and we start to pull. That's. I mean, there's no more exciting moment at the bench than that. So and I, I, may, I just may, you just did this right. Yeah. That is a universal gesture in almost every culture for trying to sense the essence of creativity. Right, I'm rubbing my fingers, yeah. my two yeah. fingers John, against John, my thumb. Yeah, John yeah. Howell does it when he's, does he when really? he's oh. trying to capture the moment. When I'm with Chinese creatives, which I work with frequently up yeah. in China, they'll, they'll feel the moment between their fingers. And I see it commonly wow. amongst people that are trying to find that moment. And uh, I wonder if there's something in it, eh? That's yeah. It's totally true. It's also the universal symbol for money, yeah. right? But, or value. Yeah, or value. value. For, for Maybe me, it is that. Maybe I, I always like the fact that that was the direction uh, Steven Spielberg gave to Alfred Molina as Harrison Ford was about to tip mm. the bag for the yeah. idol. And he goes, oh, like this. Yeah. And you see in the behind the scenes material that Spielberg comes up with this in that moment and yeah. goes, you know what? Put your fingers up and do this. Wow. And it's the, it's the gesture of, yeah. of value. Yeah. For yeah, me, maybe it's finding the always, value of the idea. <laughs> yeah. This is my rolling a ball of plasticine to keep it warm for the next thing I change. So I'm always sculpting like this. But maybe, maybe well, we're that's also a we're also feeling for that that tiny little. It's like um, uh, those of us who work uh, and build stuff. I'm sure you've had it when you grab a microfiber cloth and you feel it grip on every torn piece of skin yes. on your calloused hands. Of course, and we're looking yeah. for that tiny little thread, that little thing that tells us, oh, you, something's happened here. And, and again, wow. it's it's pulling on those threads until they're ropes, and pulling on those until something. When I was a child, um, we didn't have cotton. Uh, 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 sheets on our beds. We had these horrible synthetic uh, uh, sheets that had been handed down and and that was one of the worst sensations and you get into bed and every little nick that oh. you got off your off your craft <laughs> knife and your, yes. would catch on these synthetic wow. sheets and say the same thing. I have an almost, uh, I don't mind fingers on a chalkboard at all, but Ooh. grabbing a microfiber cloth elicits that feeling from me. <laughs> it, it, yeah. it feels genuinely true. Yeah. This is something you didn't yes. know about yeah. me. Yeah. ASMR. For me, for me, it's tin foil. Um, milk bottle tops, oh. which we used to get, remember, yeah, on the top, yeah. in the back of your teeth. Oh. We used to challenge oh. each other to, because, you know, with, with really crappy fillings, which probably you guys of your use, oh, yeah, no, of I, my I generation, we got those terrible amalgam fillings, and you chew on a piece of tin oh, foil. No, <laughs> so, so I, uh, when I was a kid, uh, The Spy Who Loved Me was the first James Bond film I saw, and I came home, and I took a pack of Wrigley's gum, which came in the silver foil, each piece of gum, and I took a silver foil, and I sculpted it on oh, my upper teeth, and I took great. a piece of foil, I sculpted it on my bottom teeth, and I'm like, I just, ah! And then I literally started to shriek as yeah, the tin yeah, foil yeah. contact my fillings, yeah. and it was basically like filling your mouth full of nine volt batteries. Yes, it's exactly. The worst feeling. That's exactly the sensation. <laughs> we used to lick the end of a nine volt battery. Yeah. <laughs> did you ever meet Richard Keelan passing before he passed in all your cons and I stuff? I did not. I admit he would love that story. Do you, right. know, do you know where I saw that film? 
Yeah. Uh, I lived uh, five kilometres up the road from uh, King Seat Hospital, which was a psychiatric hospital uh, in South Auckland. And uh, the kids, one, one, on one occasion, uh, were invited, uh, the, the children of the doctors and nurses that served there, were invited to go and um, uh, watch uh, a movie with uh, the patients there. <laughs> and I was invited as a guest. I was about seven years old, eight years old, whatever it was. And I was invited along to go and uh, share watching uh, this James Bond movie with this uh, group of people. And it was very colourful and very noisy, to say the <laughs> least, but, but joyful all the same. So. I don't know that if I've told you, you knew this or if you know this, but the very first two of your films that I saw, uh, uh, Bad Taste, or Dead Alive, uh, which Brain Dead. Yeah. I saw the Brain Dead version. Uh, and oh, meet really? the Feebles. So, okay, yeah. great. And I saw them in the Pixar screening room in Pixar's first Yeah, no, uh, offices you did tell me Richmond, that's California. bizarre. Wow. How on earth they got them? I... Yeah, my great. friend my friend Rick Sayer, uh, was early employee at Pixar, he used to have screenings for his friends of weird movies. And he was like, just come out, you're going to see this nearly pornographic Muppet film and it's going to change your life. Yeah. <laughs> those, are, um, those are the films uh, that when I think when Bernard Hill was offered the part of Thayer and he, he called Peter and said I've just uh, watched okay, he didn't know who Peter was oh. so those are the two films he watched <laughs> and he, he told Peter and, and then he said Peter was on the other line and there was a pause and he just said oh you didn't <laughs> <laughs> but he came out anyway. and on that note yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we've gone for hours and hours but thank you both so much for this yeah. <laughs> we have so much we're filming here that we can't wait to share with our audience I know that you guys can't wait to share yeah. with the world um, thank um, you so much for your generosity, and we feel so much like family when we come here. You are. I just love you guys. Yeah. Come to San Francisco, Johnny. Yeah, I will, I'll come on this year. Good. I've got a, a con I gotta be at, so. We're gonna build something in the cave while you're there. Uh, and yeah. you too, Richard. You have not been to the cave yet. No, we'll have I to haven't. Work that out. No, I've been to it in VR. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it was so real. I said, it's a new, that, um, I was worried to speak in case um, Adam put his thumb through the band sword. Sort of <laughs> <laughs> it was really like being there. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you guys cool. for joining us on Great. the podcast. Thanks so much. Great. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.